Welcome to Speak of the Devil. My name is Reverend Campbell, and today I'm being joined by none other than Warlock Jeff Bowling. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. Well, I appreciate you telling me that I misspelled militias, <laughs> because <laughs> that's embarrassing. <laughs> you know I wasn't going to let you live that down. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. You got you to gotta get called out when you do something wrong so you can learn from it. Spell check, people. It's important. Uh, quick shout out to William Nemet. Thanks for joining the Night Circle. Welcome, man. Uh, Joachim, it's okay if we don't hear you. Just knowing you're there is enough for me, <laughs> I guess. Demented one. Where have you been? What rock did you climb out from under? Exactly. <laughs> it's been a little bit, man. Uh, Wes, always great to see you. Always great to hear from you. Dog, what is happening? Sebastian, how you doing? Thanks for tuning in live, man. All right. So we're talking about militias here. Uh, now, this is, I, I think it's only fair to sort of set up the show. Um, I had run a, a segment on Nine Cents last week where I sort of brushed over, you know, my own biased opinions of militias. And you, uh, Warlock Bowling, reached out and said, hey, 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 let's get a little bit uh, more detail, a little more facts laying the groundwork so people get a little context to opinions and thoughts, and I thought that was a great fucking idea. So we were able to sync our schedules up for this particular show, and I'm really uh, glad that you did reach out and that we could talk about this. I do think it's important that people understand where we are coming from. Mm, Specifically, yeah. we're both veterans. Um, we have military service under our belt. You're a wartime vet. I am not. Um, you are the... Is it is it com commander of the... Um, of Infernal Legion. Infernal yeah. Legion. Commander in the Infernal Legion. Commander. Okay. Um, military ranks, I don't really understand. <laughs> As a veteran. How does that work again? What are the three to five stars? Um, so uh, anyone who is a veteran, uh, who has served, who is also a Satanist, uh, where can they go to, I don't know, learn more about the Infernal Legion or reach out to you? Well, if you're interested in uh, joining the Infernal Legion or just seeing what we're all about, I encourage everyone to visit infernallegion.org. Mm. Um, we also run a bi-monthly podcast on Radio Free Satan. Um, we have uh, the first episode of the month is called Sinister Scuttlebutt, where we discuss uh, news and current events in the military and the VA. And the second one is we usually interview and highlight a satanic veteran on the show. And then we're all over social media, uh, Facebook and uh, let's see, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, MeWe, Parlor, the Undercroft. <laughs> I don't know half of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're we're all we're all over social media. So if you want to see like our our stupid memes or like news updates that aren't on the podcast, that kind of thing, then just yeah. check us out on social media. I do think it's important for an organization to be available where the audience is. So, you know, I, I think that is important, especially when you're talking about um, veterans and their service and how that may relate to uh, Satanism as a religion that we all connect with, of course. Um, of course, that's not the frame of this conversation. So if you are a veteran and you are a Satanist, please feel free to reach out. I think it's important. Uh, support is available. What we're talking about today, however, are militias. Now, uh, Patrick DeMarco is in the chat room. He brought up some points that I tried to attack immediately on during our show. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to stamp down. Um, we're well, going to be, be covering... fair. You got you. You guys did have a good conversation about it, but yeah. that wasn't the topic of the segment. It right. just kind of came up. Yeah. And uh, and when I heard it, and when I was watching the live chat replay. I was like, this seems like something that not a lot of people actually understand. Mm. <laughs> yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And here's the thing. Uh, the Daily Show with Trevor Noah just did a segment on this very <laughs> fucking topic that I saw yesterday. And so I was like, God damn it, we're a day late. What the fuck? <laughs> I was so upset because he covered it brilliantly. And I was just was fucking a day late. And it sucks. But what are you going to do? Um Let's define militias for the sake of the conversation, because I do think that people come in with ideas depending on where you land politically, where you land culturally. Uh, everyone has a slightly different understanding. And so we're going to sort of define where we're coming from in the context of militias. And that's going to be the context of the conversation that we're going to have moving forward. Again, this is going to be primarily focused on the United States of America. 
So if you are in other nations and you are dealing with militias as you are right now all over the fucking world, this is probably not going to be very, um, I don't know, germane to you at all. So sorry about that, but you know, (laughs) if you're not America, you don't matter. (laughs) Not true, but you know, all right. So definitions, uh, a few different definitions here, uh, depending on where you're looking online, but they all share the same uh, ideas. A militia is a military force that is raised from the civil population to supplement a regular army in an emergency. Uh, The second is a military force that engages in rebel or terrorist activities in opposition to a regular army. And the third is a private group of armed individuals that operates as paramilitary paramilitary force and is typically motivated by political or religious ideology. So I do think what you find in those definitions is the evolution of militia throughout the American experience. That's an interesting way of putting that. Uh, which I, I think is that. very yeah. interesting to reflect on. Um, so let's let's talk about. Everyone knows why I'm here. I'm, I'm running the damn show. That's why I'm here. I don't know shit about shit, but you're here because you've had real life experience. So do you want to talk about that for a minute? Sure. Uh, well, it's it's. I guess you could say I have a lifetime of experience. No shit. Uh, dealing with militias. Uh, I was so for those of you who don't know about my background, I was born and half raised in Eastern Kentucky. Um, and militias, especially anti-government militias are very prevalent in that area. Um, they're also very involved with the community. So Mm -hmm. a lot of times your, uh, uh, festivals, fairs, things like that would be put on or sponsored by a militia in the area. Um, and then I joined the military and, uh, I was in the national guard for the first year and I want to say eight months of my military career, uh, which is essentially a form of the militia uh, in modern America. Um, after going to active duty, um, I was getting ready for my first deployment. And that's when I first reconnected with my father, who I hadn't seen since I was nine months old. So wow. <laughs> for all intents and purposes, I had never seen him. Uh, and I found out that he was part of an anti-government militia that lived down in the wilds of Kentucky. Um, they basically grew tobacco to subsidize their weapons purchases and things of that nature. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, and then while I was still in the service, I started meeting people because the the modern militia has kind of changed. Um, groups like the Three Percenters, the Oath Keepers, they're, they're more international or national. Um, And so their members are likely to be found in the military and they have their little tattoos and their, you know, things like that that mark them. Um, After getting out of the military, I went to work in uh, private security contracting. Um, And one of the big things in the PMC companies I worked for was they specifically looked for and sought out veterans who were parts of militias to hire. (laughs) Um, So I ended up working very closely with a lot of those guys. And then after that part of my life was over, I started doing security consultation. And as part of the security consultation work, um, I was in DHS briefings uh, weekly and meeting up with uh, other security contractors and things of that nature. And one of our big focuses, aside from the international terrorist threat, was the domestic terrorism caused by largely right-wing militias. So uh, it's kind of been a part of my life since I was a baby. Wow. <laughs> That's a while. Yeah. Um, my experience is dramatically different. Uh, I grew up in a rural area that is very religiously dominated by Mormons and Mormons are very much preppers and religious zealots, uh, entirely. And then there's a sort of subsect of them that mm-hmm. are nearly uh, the closest thing you can get to holy marauders, you know, they're, they're like the Knights <laughs> Templar of, of insane, uh, Mormon religious militia members. Um, and so they, they stockpile, not just food for, you know, what ifs, but also guns and ammunition, because when the Lord comes again, it's going to be violent, <laughs> you know, Praise I mean, the Lord and pass the ammunition. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the truth is, is they want the world to fucking end. That, that's their goal. And it, vir- virtually every religion wants that to happen. They want that second coming or whatever the version of that second coming is so they can go fuck virgins in heaven um, because they clearly couldn't do that in real life for some reason. <laughs> they don't got game. 
Um, and so uh, I, I never had firsthand experience at all. Uh, mine was very much secondary, third hearsay type um, relations and connecting with other individuals. They're like, oh man, I was just reached out to by a militia in Utah. You know, they, they want to get together and, you know, they, they're talking about moving up to Idaho and connecting with this other militia out there. Or there was um, one member of the church when I was a kid who was reaching out to my dad, who was a decorated veteran, who said that Christ had come and he was up in Washington uh, forming a militia. <laughs> <laughs> so he was like, come with me. Let's go see Christ in, in the militia. And uh, you know, that, that kind of tracks, honestly, if you read the Bible, that kind of tracks. <laughs> Washington was a great place for, for Jesus. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that's my experience is, is never actually meeting a sane militia member. And the thing is, is you do have a little bit of, well, I mean, maybe more than a little bit. You have a lot. The thing is, I believe in the second amendment, right? I, 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 yeah own firearms. I've, I've been around firearms my entire life. I've been around hunters my entire life. It's not a foreign concept to me. In my service, I learned how to use them properly. I was in the Boy Scouts before that, so I learned how to use them properly. So I have a deep respect for firearms, but you find some firearm enthusiasts going sort of the extra mile. And those yeah. are the ones that are really kind of prone to militia behavior. And what I find is more frustrating than anything, and, and we're going to get into some of this as we move along here, but is uh, the, the firearm enthusiast who has zero firearms training and ze like official training, zero military experience, and they're the ones that want to be in the militia. That's where I have right. a real issue. The concept of militias, I'm not averse to. I think it's important to have a National Guard. I think it's important to have an Army Reserve that's the modern version of a militia. And I think it's great. And I think having a citizenry, uh, a citizenship uh, that is educated and properly trained as a, an, or, or an, un, um, is it unorganized or an, uh, yeah, un unorganized, unorganized militia, militia yeah. I think is also important. We have to be able to de, I grew up in the red dawn era where yeah. <laughs> Russia was a constant threat and so and I really, I really think that, that that movie is what really popularized the militia idea that, yeah, that we right. understand it today. Yeah, Fuck yeah, and it was a good movie too. <laughs> it was, it was I mean, great. It was great. Yeah. The remake uh, was was shit, but the, yeah, the original. Yeah. I I actually haven't seen the remake because I'm afraid. <laughs> I don't want to spoil <laughs> the wonderfulness of the original. Uh, that being said, that that's kind of where we're gonna start off. That that's our starting point. One of us with a lot of experience, one with none. <laughs> and then the, the, the craziness will ensue. But let's talk about militias in the context of the early United States, because this is what people traditionally jump onto when they think, no, we have to have militias. They're, you know, it, it's a completely normal and fine thing. And the truth is, it was integral to the founding of this country. If it yeah. wasn't for militias and France's ability to help train a continental military we would not exist. And so you can't really well, discount. But even if you go before that, uh, the militias were so important to the existence of the colonies before we even thought about revolution. Right. If it wasn't for the militias, uh, in, well, the National Guard likes to say that it started in 1636. Mm -hmm. I have a little bit of an issue with that, but <laughs> but if it wasn't for the early uh, colonial militias, uh, we wouldn't have survived uh, the attacks from Native Americans. We wouldn't have mm -hmm. survived attacks from other settlements. Uh, when they ran out of food, we wouldn't have survived bears. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, or a pack of know. wolves. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and and that's where we have to really distill down exactly what this is. And and it was defined in some of the official uh, dictionary definitions. But a militia is a group of people defending their family, their neighbors, their territory. That's yeah. it. Um, and so in that context. I don't think that can be construed as a bad thing. It's self-preservation. It's the highest law. We as Satanists certainly celebrate the concept. So I think it's the, 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 the straying from the protecting of one's family, neighbors, and community into I need to fight against the community. That's where the discord, I think, right. comes in. And we'll get into that here in just a second. Um. But yeah, I mean, the, the militias were incredibly important in early America. The regulation of the militia was codified in the Second Continental Congress by the Articles of Confederation. Military service was distinguished, I'm sorry, militia service was distinguished from military service in that the latter was normally a 
commitment for a fixed period of time, or at least a year, for a salary, whereas militia was only to meet a threat or prepare to meet a threat for periods of time expected to be short. It was a reactionary yeah. force of sorts. Um, you're expected to have your own training based on your own life. You're expected to have your own gear, your own firearm based on your own existence. And because let's be honest, colonials back in the day, you had to have firearms to survive, yeah. <laughs> period. You didn't, you, you didn't get meat unless you could barter or trade for it and you couldn't defend your home. So you yeah. had to have it. Um, and that's again, one of the reasons why I support the second amendment. I think it's so important. Um, and then moving forward a little bit in, in time, of course, the Revolutionary War happened. There have been a number of uh, militia acts over the years that have sort of helped try to define and codify what it means to be in a militia in the United States. The military or the Militia of Act of 1903, also known as the Efficiency in the Militia Act or the Dick Act, based on the uh, senator who proposed it, was legislation enacted by the United States Congress to create an early National Guard and which codified the circumstances under which the Guard could be federalized. And what a lot of people don't really understand is that the different states, governments, before it was formed into a union, the United States, uh, a federal uh, identity, people really didn't want that. They really wanted to just live within the boundaries of their own states. They felt like that right. was the boundary of their community. That's the type of people that they knew and they felt comfortable with. And they didn't want to stray beyond that. And so when people finally adopted this idea of a constitution of the United States and created a federal uh, representation of democracy, uh, that completely changed everything because that meant that there had to be a federal military force which meant there had to be taxes to pay for it yeah. and then you had to have your local militias augment that federal force because again it was only 13 colonies and we were surrounded by the french the british and indians <laughs> like wild yeah natives. A, lot, a lot of people don't realize i think that the the continental army was stood up uh as part of the revolution trained by the french as you mentioned and the prussians yeah. um and then after the revolution was over and Britain had surrendered, they disbanded the Continental Army. It didn't exist anymore. Now, that only lasted for a certain amount of time because George Washington obviously was a military-minded individual, as were many of the founding fathers. Um, so they ended up eventually bringing it back. But there was a period of time, several periods of time, actually, where we didn't have a standing federal military. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the fact is, is, you know, military service was only for a year, militias were able to be called at any point in time and the reason why they felt the need to establish laws like the militia acts of um the 1792 1795 1903 and the subsequent uh, amendments and versions of that is because depending on where you lived and the time that you had because again you had to run a farm or a plantation or you 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 had to actually work for a living you yeah. can't just sit in, <laughs> on a computer and type like i do um you didn't have time to train to take three or two weeks out of the month or one week out of the month to just go train and learn tactics first of all tactics didn't really exist at all back then and so yeah, no. the reliability the um the fact that they just weren't well equipped and they weren't um, really desiring to to go into national conflicts outside of their state. And mm -hmm. you see this with uh, the War of 1812 and New York militia not wanting to go fight uh, the British in Canada. Understandably, yeah. there was no federal reason for them to do so. And so that's why you had to form these uh, laws to put in place to say, no, 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 look, if you're going to exist as a militia, and we're going to exist as a union. We need a defense force. Our continental military is not enough. It's just, it, it's, it was begun too recently. The men aren't trained really well. We need supplemental people. And that's what militias are there for. So when you reflect on the Second Amendment and you think in terms of a well-armed militia, you're not talking about nowadays constructs. You're talking about men, white men, only oh, white men. Yep. Um, of the ages fighting of 17 age, 17 and 45. Yeah, yeah, so very specific. White men between 17 and 45 
who uh, had weapons and were able to fight were required to go and fight. And so that's the context of that Second Amendment, which makes perfect sense. Why would you restrict the people that are there to defend your nation on whether or not they could have firearms? That doesn't make sense. You want them to have firearms. Right. Um, so we can extrapolate out from that all we want, but that's what it meant when it was written. Um, and so, you know, in the 19th century, the militia in each U.S. state and territory operated under the Militia Acts of 1792, which was extended by the one in uh, 1795. And they left the question of states versus federal control of the militia unresolved. Because, again, each militia was confined to their territory and larger than that, their state. So why should – and this is an American idea from the very beginning. This is yeah. why it was so difficult to adopt – a constitution in the first place because Americans have never wanted anyone outside of their community to tell them what to do and when to do it. And so the idea of a federal government telling you to grab your men and women and weapons and go fight in a war against people and with people that you don't know was an irrational idea to Americans right. and is still today, if we're going to be honest. And especially when you look at, uh, early trade regulations between the states uh yeah. like you were mentioning the war of 1812 and the new york militia um they were right on the border with canada and i believe at the time philadelphia was the uh was the capital of the united states mm -hmm. it might it might have been washington by then i'm not really sure but um so the capital of the country the federal government was so far away from them uh you know several days ride by horse um, New York was doing its own thing. Its farmers yeah. were doing its own thing. Its hunters were doing their own thing. And they were trading with the guys in Canada and with the natives in Canada. Um, and so all of a sudden, uh, some, some federal, you know, military guys ride in and say, hey, we're going to war with Canada. And they're like, I just traded beaver pelts with them last yeah. week. Why, why would I go to war with them? Yeah. We have handshake <laughs> deals. Like, why would I do that? <laughs> And it makes perfect sense, you know, on the ground. It makes perfect sense. Um, but that's the discord between uh, the federal view of conflict and the local view. You know, if you have to survive, then you're going to make deals in order to survive. And that's in conflict with the federal perception. Then, you know, s someone has to give. Something's got to give. Um, the 1903 Act repealed the Militia Acts of 1990, or 1795 and designated the militia per Title 10 of the U.S. Code, Section 311, as two different classes. And this is where it all gets messy. You have yep. the unorganized militia, and the which was included all able-bodied white men between ages 17 and 45. And, and I want to keep reiterating does. that. What's that? <laughs> it said it still technically does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it. they've never really addressed that issue at all, which I think is part of the problem. I mean, states have. There are state ideas right. that have been sort of put in place, but federally it hasn't really been addressed. Um, and I want to sort of double down on that idea of the white 17 to 45 male, because women didn't have rights back then. Uh, immigrants, slaves specifically, had zero rights back then. Um, and so, again, think of it in terms of the era that it was put in place, and we understand intention much better. Um, and then the second part of that was the organized militia, which comprised state militias, which they termed the National Guard, units receiving federal support. And the reason why they did that, again, was because of reliability and equipment. They wanted to make sure that if militias were called to war, they were under federal control and they had the knowledge and the gear that were the same as the federal military. And that's so we could provide a unified effective front to whatever hostiles we are attacking or, or, you know, putting a front in front of. Um, and that's really important in a military environment. When you reflect on the concept of fighting, and if you can't rely on the guy next to you because his musket may not reliably fire because he doesn't take care of it and it's all rusted, you're not going to care about that guy as much as you are someone that's got your back, that's been training with you, that has the same equipment, that's taken care of in the same way that you take care of yours. It's, yeah. it's all esprit de corps and understanding that that person is going to be a reliable part of your survival in any conflict. And as, as a soldier, that's integral. You have yeah, to have absolutely. that. Um, 
And so let's move forward. Uh, I've got a, diff a couple different articles and a couple different sources. All of these are going to be linked in the show notes so you can sort of look it up on your own and come to your own understandings here based on the facts. Um, let's talk a little bit about military organiza organizations in the United States because, or militia organizations because <laughs> this is really where it starts to get um, interesting, I'll say. Uh, we, we go from militias being recognized as part of a federal organization, but that unorganized militia element sort of spirals off on its own depending on who is leading it, who is forming it, and what they're perceiving our federal government doing. This and and, and I, I do think again it's it's really important to sort of double triple down on this concept. Americans have always fought between the idea of a federal government telling them what to do and their local government telling them what to do. We're independent people by nature. Uh, and again just the, the promise of America is your individual ability to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and have the world laid out in front of you if you're willing to work for it. But then you also then have these governmental people coming in and telling you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And so, of course, there's going to be conflict. That That's is inherent in America. It's always been there. It is not new. So let's stop pretending like it's some sort of bad thing or some hick thing or some new thing. It's always been there. Um, all right, so militia groups may refer to themselves as militia, unorganized militia, and constitutional militia. The catalyst, uh, as according to the federal government, came with the FBI's 1992 shootout with Randy Weaver at Ruby Ridge. Um, that was the yeah. biggest one. And the 1993 Waco siege, live on TV, involving David Koresh and the Branch Davidians at, Mark Carmel, at Mount Carmel in Waco, Texas. If you're just a regular citizen... And you're watching the federal government go in and burn alive a group of religious individuals. How could you not think that the federal government's going too far? If you watch the right. federal government go in and swarm uh, a group of uh, militia men in um, uh, Ruby Ridge, I think that was Idaho, right? Yeah. Right. Then and, and just you know attack them. It's natural to draw teams this is a human trait we're tribal mm -hmm. we're gonna land in our own little team area and say well whoa, whoa, whoa who is the federal government to tell individuals in a state what they can and can't do what firearms are okay what they're planning on doing or not if they haven't overtly done anything illegal then it's no one's fucking business at that point um right. and so it's completely in my opinion understandable to have this aversion to federal influence uh in your personal life like that's yeah. th that's normal uh, the 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 interesting thing about both of those cases is that uh on the back end now so many years later when we have all the information laid out in front of us neither of those people actually did anything illegal um not i mean they uh, david koresh certainly had a history of criminal activity but in the moment what they were raiding the the waco compound for was because he had a stockpile of firearms, mm -hmm. which it's in the middle of Texas. You, you better have a stockpile of firearms if yeah. you're not Texan. You know? And then the same thing with Ruby Ridge. Now, both of these individuals, uh, David Koresh and the Weaver family, I, I don't agree with like 99% of their viewpoints, but it, the Weaver family was even exonerated in court of any wrongdoing except for failure to appear. Mm -hmm. And that was the only thing that they that they actually but, pushed on it. So when the, so when there, the was federal no, government there was no was, reason for the federal government to be there. Right. W but, I mean, it wasn't the reason why they were turned on to them was that they were buying large amounts of firearms. It wasn't that they were illegal, yes. but they just they were massing them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They, they were they were building them up. And, and obviously, David Koresh being the uh, animated weirdo that he was, yeah. um, had said a lot of things. But there was, as far as anyone could tell, there was no credible threat. And I believe the uh, the judge even got his hand smacked afterwards for even issuing the warrant in the first place yeah. for the Waco siege. Yeah, the Waco thing was was a disaster for the federal government in, in all forms of understanding. Um, <laughs> the fact that they even had a standoff for so long, the fact yeah. that they were even, you know, the, the thing is, is Waco, they were, they were selling firearms illegally. That's why they were, like, brought to their attention. But whether that was worth or, or or demanded the attention that was given to it by the federal government i think is up for debate and i don't yeah. personally think it was um 
because our our laws on on selling firearms they seem malleable <laughs> at best. <Yeah. laughs> well, especially in places like Texas or Idaho. Yeah. Um, and and then on top of that, the federal government came in. It was the uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, mm-hmm. and eventually the FBI took over the case. Um, but they came in and they didn't even alert local authorities. Like mm-hmm. the sheriff's office had no idea that this was going down. And and the sheriff is supposed to be again. It's a it's an American, you know, concept. The sheriff is. The law of the county. He is yeah. the head honcho of the county, and uh, you're just going to walk into his backyard and start burning buildings down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's it's definitely it goes back to that militia concept of the state or the county versus the federal government, the constant uh, pull and, and tearing between those two ideas yeah. in America. And and Dog is saying in the chat room that Ruby Ridge wasn't about militia. Waco wasn't about militia, but militias saw that behavior or individuals saw that behavior that overreach as they saw it of the federal government and that's when they started thinking oh shit we shouldn't be worrying about foreign oppression right. we should be worrying about the government coming in and telling us what we can and can't do we have a legal right to these firearms yeah. we have a legal right to make money this is fucking america so <laughs> if blue collar people are lying, cheating and stealing and, and, and weaseling their way through a fortune, why can't we? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, white collar and, and we're blue collar. Why can't we do the same thing? Right. You know, we're seeing uh, disproportionate uh, legal ramifications for behavior. If you're wealthy, you don't get smacked as hard as if you're poor, for example. Um, yeah. And we see tons of anecdotal situations like that so as an american who uh doesn't like that concept and is very much uh you know prone to the idea of banding together with other like-minded americans and defending their family neighbors and territory then of course they would and they did in mass form militias against the government and this is when you're first starting to see the idea of the militia turn from and and to be clear on the uh the, the branch, just real quick, the, the Branch Davidians were a religious cult, and there was a handful of uh, British nationals who were in that compound, um, along with the Americans, and there was maybe four or five guys who had actually been trained on weaponry. They were just sure the apocalypse was coming, and that's a common theme that's shared with militias that were created in their wake. Um, with Ruby Ridge, uh, the Weaver family, uh, I believe that the patriarch was an ex-Green Beret, and... Uh, he already had his set up, but while the siege was happening, there was a militia in that area that was bringing them food and water so they could survive the siege. They, they knew their way in and out of the woods, and they would bring food and water to the cabin. But that was the only involvement of militias at that time. Um, what happened after both of those incidents was the bombing of the Oklahoma City Federal Building, which mm-hmm. Timothy McVeigh uh, tied directly to those incidents as proof, just like you were saying, of look, look at you know how how much of a threat they are, and that's really what sparked it. All these militias started popping up all over the place after those those three incidents. Yeah, and I don't know if it's just a natural human trait, or if it's a type of individual that latches onto this idea. Um, and I certainly struggle with it myself. But this idea of how how brittle society is Mm -hmm. and and how simple it would be and we saw it with toilet paper earlier this year yeah (laughs) um how simple it would be to see a breakdown in society so quickly and so the idea of having people you can rely on just as if you were a soldier in battle is Mm -hmm. so important for survival and this is a natural human trait fight or flight survival of the fittest we are tribal creatures because we want to rely on others for survival so we band together with like-minded individuals it's normal that's what humans do um and so i I don't want to i don't want to paint militias as obscure or crazy or strange because the concepts are sound it's the execution or some of the inherent you know uh, group ideas that are strange in my personal opinion and certainly some of the behaviors, I think, because uh, they're they're just provoking reactions rather than defending their own place. Um, critic Mark Pickcavage describes the militia movement in the 1990s. The militia movement is a right-wing movement that arose following controversial standoffs of the 1990s. It inherited paramilitary traditions of earlier groups. 
especially the conspiratorial anti-government posse comitatus. The militia movement claims the militia groups are sanctioned by law, but uncontrolled by government. In fact, they are designed to oppose a tyrannical government. The movement's ideology has led some adherents to commit criminal acts, including stockpiling illegal weapons and explosives and plotting to destroy buildings or assassinate public officials as well as, as, well as lesser confrontations. And we just saw in, in Michigan um, a militia group try to uh, abduct their governor, I think it was. That's a, that's a very interesting case in Michigan, too, uh, because as, as more and more evidence comes out, it, it doesn't actually seem like this was a, in any way organized it was like five dudes, right? Effort. Yeah, it was like five <laughs> dudes, one of which was an FBI agent. <laughs> and, and, uh, and there's they're starting – well, obviously the defense is going to use this tool, but we'll see how it pans out in court. But uh, they're, they're saying that the FBI agent was the one who came up with the idea. So almost like you know he was the one that, that pushed them in that direction, which the defense is arguing is textbook and trap. So <laughs> mm. it's, a, it's a very interesting situation. Now that said – in Michigan, uh, militias are huge in Michigan, yeah, and not just uh, not just these these like uh, right wing and even some left wing fringe militias, but Michigan has its own national guard. It also has the Michigan they call it the Michigan Guard, I believe, which is a state run militia um, that isn't associated with the national guard. They train with them, but they don't go through basic training. They don't you know do all that they just they wear a uniform and then they do things like emergency disaster relief and things of that nature yeah. they also have their own naval militia up wow. there uh and that's again state run so michigan is big on these militias and then governor whitmer whew, um where do i even start with her uh <laughs> When, when, when all these lockdowns went into place, and I understand, you know, you can feel some kind of way on either side about the lockdowns and masks and things like that. Um, even I sat here uh, reading some of the stuff that she was doing, like banning the sale of seeds and planting it, um, uh, forcing nursing homes to take sick patients in when, you know, as we all know at this point, the most vulnerable in our society to this virus are the elderly. Yeah. Uh, she was forcing sick people into those nursing homes. I'm honestly surprised uh, one of the other militias didn't stand up and actually do something instead of just talking to the FBI about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, this is the worst part about whenever you run across anyone who is in any uh, local or federal uh, military or government service uh, or just a, a, you know police or, or fire department, we have to understand – they're just dudes <laughs> like they're just people mm -hmm. men and women yeah. they're just citizens yeah. just like you and so they're no more uh well prepared for emergencies as anyone else and so when a governor they're in a position of great authority makes poor decisions people tend to forget that they're just people trying to yeah. adjust yeah. to a situation and they make mistakes and the fact is, is most politicians don't admit to their mistakes, which is why people don't trust them so much. But, you know, making bad mistakes, I think, is a normal thing to do. Owning up and adjusting fire is the appropriate reaction, right. not that's, to double down. That's where I will, I will come to her defense on that. Uh, the, the legislature and eventually the state Supreme Court shut down a lot of her, I guess, what you call draconian measures. Mm -hmm. And most of them went away after that. And that's what the checks and balances is for. Yeah. A lot of people in today's society don't want they we understand that bureaucracy is slow. We understand that government is slow to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what the system is in place for. And in Michigan, it mostly worked, I think. I mean, there was already elderly people dying from the virus as a result of her nursing home thing. I understand bad decision, bad call. I understand people are upset about that. But again, the bureaucracy did what it did and the checks and balances worked and checked her power. <laughs> so uh, so, so I will, I will give that credit to the system in that regard, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's always interesting because it's very few people who are able to have, uh, the desire to have that type of a vision to you mm. know, put things in context and, and, you know, give credit where credit's due when a mistake is made and people own up to it or when the system actually works for once, because yeah. <laughs> it doesn't seem to work very much. Yeah. <laughs> so it's nice when it does to acknowledge it. Um, and I will say that according to the, uh, the government, uh, the militia movement was actually in a decline uh, by 96. Mm -hmm. But when Barack Obama came into office, it spurred right back up with full fury. 
And it's funny because everyone, you know, anecdotally um, is saying that there's no real racism anymore or it's not a real issue. But when a black man becomes president and it spurs a dump, a bunch of militias, you can't help but think that has something to do with it. Like, yeah, because you can't you can't use the argument with Barack Obama uh, that he was, I guess you could say, uh, authoritarian or tyrannical in any way. I mean, we had just had George W. Bush sign in the Patriot. Right. So it wasn't like he was any he wasn't any better, but he yeah. wasn't any worse than George W. Bush. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's some nuance in there that I don't really want to get into politically, but, but mm. I, there was, there was some things that Barack Obama was much worse at in my personal opinion sure. than George yeah. W. Bush was, but W. Bush was a travesty, <laughs> a travesty <laughs> for, but I think a lot of people also forget how, how conspiratorial the, the two thousands were. Oh my gosh. From, yes. from like 2000 to 2000 yeah. to 2009, because we had so much going on. I mean, when September 11th happened, obviously any event that big is going to, the conspiracies are going to come out of the world. Mm. Um, we instantly went to war uh, with, with Iraq. <laughs> and then all of a sudden we're at war with Iraq because yeah. why? And it was the son of the president who originally had gone to war with Iraq. So there was conspiracies abound. Then the yeah. Patriot Act comes in. Then yeah. TSA. Comes in. Um, now, then you have Barack Obama on there, and of course, the the, the disinformation people um, are instantly going to point to the black man named Barack Obama mm -hmm. and say, "Oh, he's obviously a Muslim." Yeah. <laughs> and, and then yeah. we're already afraid of Muslims in the country. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a it was a really bad decade for that type of of mentality. So I'm not surprised that militias grew in strength and the number of returning war veterans yeah, uh, who are still seeking that brotherhood who uh, the world, when you're deployed overseas in the military, the world changes, the world keeps mm -hmm. going, even though you're not there. So you often find veterans who are like, well, I was over here and I was fighting for, you know, these three things or whatever. And when I come home, I find out those three things don't exist anymore. Yeah. Or people are in stark opposition to those things that I was defending. Right, or, right. Or, you know, yeah. willing to lay my life down or watching my brothers in arms getting murdered for. Right. Yeah. It's, it's fucked being a soldier. <laughs> like. <laughs> it really is. There's no upside, it seems like, in some, in some cases. It's just Except all. for good memories. <laughs> yeah. You just, you're just damned if you do, damned if you don't type with, with fucking soldiers. Um. Yeah, so you know, military groups, uh, militia groups have uh, recently been involved in several high-profile standoffs, including the Bundy standoff of 2014, yeah. which I think was total bullshit, and the occupation of the uh, Mahler National Wildlife Refuge in 2016, which I also which think was also total involved the Bundys. <laughs> bullshit. Yeah, yeah, but that one, the, the 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 wildlife refuge was interesting because they were calling to all militias to come join us and you know face the federal government and you know make our stance here and a couple of them did for a little bit <laughs> yeah, i think that's, uh, it, you had uh, it was under a hundred yeah. uh, people all together that showed up from from different disparate militias mm -hmm. and if you listen to the uh the founder uh his name escapes me the founder of the oath keepers which is a kind of a, a modern militia um he recounts stories of people of militias both at the bundy ranch and at the wildlife refuge who were in different militias and they had a common cause but as with anything when you're in a siege situation where the the government is you know starving you out basically the little ideological differences start to appear and he was telling stories about people from opposing militias who pulled their guns on each other yeah. in this situation Jeez. So <laughs> i could definitely see that because ultimately yeah. when you're breaking it down you're talking about gangs you're talking about a group of people that have their own hierarchy, that have their sure. own ways of handling things. And everyone knows you get like 14 alphas, you know, too many cooks in a kitchen, shit's gonna get crazy. Um, uh, silly swastika in the chat room is saying certain military seems, uh, military training seems to have value. I think all military training has absolute value. It's how the civilian public treats <laughs> military vets or, or citizens in general and the federal and local governments that is and, the and, problem. And issues with, with the head. I mean, I don't think any soldier gets out of the army without some type of psychological 
or traumatic for injury. sure yeah. yeah it could be it could be as simple as what we've talked in the past about you just eat your food too fast mm -hmm. or it could be that you can't hold a job because you can't think straight you can't everything is giving you flashbacks or reminders yeah. and you end up homeless in the street and then hooked on drugs which leads to more mental illnesses so i don't think any soldier airman marine sailor gets out of the military without some kind of damage to their head yeah absolutely uh yeah, I didn't factor that into my my <laughs> response to Silly there, but you're absolutely right. <laughs> the thing is, the training I think is completely valuable to a citizenry, oh, especially yeah. the American experience. We're frontiersmen, whether you like our actions or not. This is who Americans are. You know, we're ready to defend our territory, whether we got it, you know, justifiably or not, uh, to the death. And so, yeah. to be prepared for that. I think is a net positive, especially in a world that, again, I feel is really, really brittle. Um, so if it can break down at any point, then you need to be prepared for that. And I think and we do, we, like, like you were saying earlier, we see it happen all the time. Just the littlest thing yeah. sets society into a tailspin and, and, uh, and it doesn't, it's not peaceful anymore. And that's another important aspect of military training, but also I think something the militias kind of understand without consciously recognizing it is that the modern human on average has forgotten that the world is a violent and brutal place. For sure. It is beautiful yeah. and it is overwhelming moments of peace, but violence happens at, you know, at the drop of a hat. Yeah. And uh, military training is good for that because it prepares you to, it keeps you on your guard. You're watching out what's going on, you know, uh, watching your corners and whatnot. You are, prepared to deal with a threat if it happens. And that's not saying that every soldier or whatever is, you know, Superman, or not. but <laughs> it, <not>. it's, <laughs> it certainly prepares you more than, you know, working at a factory or mm. in a, in an IT room <laughs> for, <sure. laughs> for the very real nature of, of violence. Mm -hmm. And learning how to react that I think that's the, the most important thing. And, you know, so ultimately, you know, what we're talking about is that, you know, militias took a turn. Uh, from yeah. their original intention, what they were actually used for, and to what they are today, uh, by and large. Um, so let's talk about legal legitimacy of militias. Most militia organizations envisage themselves as legally legitimate organizations authorized under constitutional and statute law with references to state and federal law of an unorganized militia. Now, we talked about that in the Military Act of like yeah. 1902, I think it was. Um, Title 32 of the United States Code outlines the role of the United States National Guard in the United States Code, but there's no mention of the organized militia, and that's up to the states to define. Others subscribe to the insurrection theory, which describes the right of the body politic to rebel against the established government in the face of tyranny. But, of course, in 1951, there was a legal case, Dennis versus the United States. The Supreme Court rejected the insurrection theory, stating that as long as the government provides free elections and trials by jury, political self-defense cannot be undertaken. Uh, on its I, I face... Take, I take a little issue with that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, on its face, it's like, oh, yeah, well, if there's free and fair elections, then how could it be, you know, tyrannical until you realize that elections are bought and sold? Right, yeah. Politicians are bought and sold. Like there or elections are completely rigged by limiting voting uh, populations and locations. I mean, that's the, an American tradition from the beginning. So, yeah, it, it, yeah, they talk about, I think uh, they call it gerrymandering. Uh, that's been going on since 1776. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like politically speaking, gerrymandering makes perfect sense. Your team gets into office and stays in office. Why wouldn't you do that? If it's available, fuck yeah. <laughs> you know, but when you think in terms of a healthy society, well, it's toxic. I mean, that's all it is. Right. Um, all right. So, there, you know, of course, the anti-government views of militias. Many high-profile organizations espouse anti-tax, anti-immigration, survivalist, sovereign citizens, libertarian, land rights, and southern restoration views. They generally share a common belief in the imminent or actual rise of a tyrannical government in the United States, which they believe must be confronted through armed force. This, I think, is very, very interesting. And I'm going to, I don't know, maybe I should, I'll, I'll wait on, and before I attack that idea in, in, for just a second here. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the active militia groups right now. So the Southern Poverty Law Center identifies 334 militia groups at a peak in 2011. It identified 276 in 2015. 
up from 202 in 2014. So this isn't a really, I don't think this is a large issue. <laughs> like anti-government it's, militias. Yeah. It's not, it's not a lot of people. Yeah. It's a it's regional not, issue. Uh, yeah. And a lot of the organizations don't necessarily agree with each other. However, mm-hmm. when they decide to do something, they usually do it very big. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's, that's where the problem lies because it's not, it's, it's very similar to, you know, we were talking about the, the global war on terror. Um, there's not a lot of terrorists out there, but when they do something, they kill thousands of people at one time. Yeah. It's very similar with the militias. Now, mind you, when I say with the militias, I'm talking about the specific subset of militias, not the ones who maybe even call themselves a militia, but their only goal is to help their community because those mm-hmm. do exist. Yeah. Um, state run or otherwise and we'll get into some myths about militias here in just a second as well um yeah so i guess my idea of of bringing out that idea of active military uh groups is that or active militia groups i keep fucking mixing those up is that there's just not that many of them and again it gets news in the same way that antifa gets in the news (laughs) but there's just there's no organization there's really not many of them and it's a small little fringe that causes problems uh, right. when it comes to militias. So well, it's the same thing in, with Antifa's case too. Like, yeah, they're not they're not a big number, but when they decide to do something, they do it very big. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's for attention. Like that's yeah. why they do it big. If if they really cared about their cause, they would just focus on the one little moment and do it. But they want attention to mm-hmm. hopefully drum up more interest or spur other actors to do what they're doing. Um, uh, okay, so let's talk about some myths about militias. Uh, militias are organized paramilitary groups that typically believe that they're the last line of defense against a tyrannical federal government. Uh, almost all belong to the patriotic movement, a broad coalition of organizations that share a general resentment of the U.S. government. So myth m- number one, militia members are especially prone to violence. Well, a 2015 Southern Poverty Law Center study of domestic terrorism concluded that lone wolves or leaderless resistance groups were responsible for most of the violence. The vast yeah. majority of attacks were the work of one or two people, such as the lone gunman who killed 23 people in El Paso last year, or the five dudes that tried to get uh, the governor <laughs> uh, this last week. It's So you can't really paint all militias with the same brush. Myth well, up. that's true, because when you look at, uh, we mentioned earlier the Oklahoma City federal building bombing that timothy mcveigh and i think it was one other gentleman was involved in Mm -hmm. um timothy mcveigh had connection to different militia groups but he was doing it on his own and that's generally true of any group once uh you might have some radical beliefs you might have some extremist beliefs but once you get together with other people and you can be comfortable airing those beliefs shooting your guns together living in the woods or whatever it is that that your militia might do you generally don't go out bombing federal buildings. You're happy just to sit there and talk shit about the government, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's a switch that needs to be flipped. <laughs> right. <laughs> For sure. Uh, okay, so myth number two, right-wing militia uh, militants love President Trump. Patriot purists find it hard to reconcile decades of anti-government ideology with their new reality. Some believe that anyone in charge of the federal government is, by definition, the enemy. And that would include Trump. So clearly not every militia member or militant is in favor of Trump, but you're going to have some because that's just human nature. Uh, Myth number three, militia's anti-government views are wildly extreme. (laughs) This is a tough one. Honestly, a lot of their views, I don't find that extreme because I also don't trust the government. I don't like taxes. I understand the need for taxes. I don't like them. (laughs) I think the federal government has been growing steadily since uh, i would say since the early 1900s at an unstoppable rate uh, and taking away states rights uh and i know that sounds like a confederate you know talking point but it's not i just mean the the semi-autonomy of the states in the united states um raising taxes getting us involved in endless wars uh so on and so forth and the the bureaucracy is insane like uh one of the things that's been a big talking point for the last four years was the deep state. Yeah. You know, Trump talks about the deep state yeah. all the time. And okay, there's something to that and not that there's this shadowy government that's doing whatever, but that there are people who work for the federal government. Everyone thinks of the president and Congress and elected officials. Right. Now, some of them stay in power for a long time, 
Oh, yeah. However, no one thinks about the guy at the post office who's been working there for 35 years. Like he, it's in his best interest to keep the bureaucracy running the way it does because yeah. that's his paycheck and his eventual retirement. His pension, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or military or, or just private contractors yeah. who don't officially work for the government but are doing government business. They want the Absolutely, bureaucracy yeah. to stay in place so they can continue to make a lot of money because they are paid very, very well. Oh, yeah. Much um, more money than the average. Like, like when I worked for a PMC, I made three times the money I made as a soldier. So yeah. <laughs> doing the same job. Yeah. Because again, there's less oversight. It's kind of off the books. If shit hits the fan, you know, there's not going to be a huge news issue right. with it. Um, okay. So let's talk about trust in the government. In 1964, 77% of Americans said that they could trust the government in Washington to do what is right most of the time. Today, only 17% of citizens say the same. And I would argue that it's less than that, yeah, just I think based on anecdotal lie. personal experience. <laughs> That's, I mean, I don't know anyone that trusts the government to do the right thing. Anyone. And certainly, you know, because this is a, you know, satanic show, uh, from a satanic perspective, you're supposed to question everything. Yeah. You know, don't, we we should know intrinsically as Satanists that the government doesn't necessarily have our best interests in heart. They have their individual interests in heart, and we may or may not benefit from their yeah. individual interests. And let's be <laughs> fair, it's about gaining and holding power. Absolutely. <laughs> it's yeah. not about – and you can just see by how the government has reacted to the COVID crisis. They tell mm -hmm. people to go to their homes and not work. And then they don't do anything to take care of them while they're not working, unable to right. buy food, pay rent, you know, live. And then they're just like, hey, you know what? We're just going to bicker politically and, you know, act like we're trying to do something. But no one actually gets any benefit. And it doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're on. People are still fucked. So yeah, yeah. you can't pretend that the government and politicians are out there to take care of you when you are fucked because of them and it can't be clearer than this last year it is so there's, yeah there's nothing like a major event to point out the yeah. flaws. 9 11 did it the recession did it uh, COVID is doing it there's nothing like a big major event to show people if they're willing to look just mm -hmm. how incompetent our government really is yeah. again because it's <laughs> run by just dudes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dudes who don't know shit about shit who are trying to get power and trying to hold power that's it that's as deep as it goes <laughs> unfortunately um okay so myth number four the patriotic or the patriot movement has a constant or a consistent ideology and the truth is, is patriots are motivated motivated by a variety of sometimes conflicting array of issues some focus on gun rights or immigration others get riled up about privacy taxes or government overreach they disagree often and are united only by their vow to protect the citizenry against a tyrannical federal government and sometimes not even that so there right. is no <laughs> overarching message or or belief system for militias it is very much localized and then just kind of up to the chapter themselves whenever they happen to decide you know whatever's going on thanks horatio i appreciate that um i don't know what php means other than the html code <laughs> but apparently it's a type of money <laughs> thanks dude um okay so myth number five racism drives the patriot movement well, the truth is, while there are plenty of virulent racists among patriots and everywhere else, racism is just not usually the part of the publicly stated ideology. Thing is, is militias are very clear about what they're created for and what their goals are. They're not hiding it at all. And just the reality is, unless it's the KKK, which is not a militia, they don't overtly say that racism is a part of it. But we have to understand that racism is inherent in human nature. It's not to right. say anti-black humans. It's just to say tribalism. That is right. who and what yeah. we are. So, and militias are absolutely a uh, modern militias are are absolutely a, a picture perfect uh, vision of tribalism taking place within a larger society. Yeah. Um, and I find when it comes to the racist thing, uh, most people look at you know what do they call them the good old boys down south right. who are who are most likely either down there or in Cascadia are are most likely to form these anti-government militias and they look at them they're predominantly white um, 
they they uh they're paramilitary they wear all this stuff they shoot their guns they talk with funny accents and they think oh they must be racist and most of them it never enters their head the the majority of racism that i see from militia groups actually comes from left-wing militia groups and that's the groups like the um uh, the one who recently made the news, the Not Fucking Around Coalition, or the uh, Navajo mm -hmm. Defense League um, down in the Navajo Reservation. These are the groups that are usually, they have, like you said, with the KKK, but usually it's these groups who have uh, race built directly into their bylaws and things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, whereas the, the, the picture we have in our head when we think of a modern militia are usually just a bunch of guys. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. who uh who don't necessarily care and it is predominantly men there are a handful of women that might get around but it is predominantly men and i think that just comes down to the the natural male drive for fraternity and the uh uh, uh sense of brotherhood and that comes with violence mm -hmm. you know uh, i think that's really what it boils down to and that's why it's mostly white men in those those types of groups but there are several militias that are made up of all blacks or all natives or all Asians um, who are very racist. Uh, and, you know, I suppose you could argue it's because they had a bad, you know, bad shake at life. And that leads them the same way that the search for brotherhood and adventure leads the other groups of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'll never, I'll never disparage anyone's personal experience and the ideas they have that are derived from that experience. Mm -hmm. Um, I always, you know, use the idea of, you know, bias helps you navigate life effectively and uh, using your own experience to determine that bias is more important than using someone else's. Um, sure. Uh, but you also have to be careful. You have to, you have to know where it's coming from, you know, know yeah, yourself. Yeah, Otherwise you just fall into a trap. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so let's round out this conversation by talking about some of the problems with militias in the Constitution. Because, again, you know, from the very beginning of this conversation, we're already at our hour, so we're going to go a little bit long here, but um, we're wrapping it up here, people. Thank you for, you know, sticking it in with us. Uh, the problem is, is that it's just not quite defined well enough. There yeah. have been, uh, you know, uh, legal battles that have helped draw boundaries, but again, it's just not firm enough and i don't know that it should be because even though i don't particularly agree that militias should be valid or not and certainly anecdotally the people that i've met that have tangentially been related with militias i don't think should even own a firearm personally because they're <laughs> fuck-ups every I'll person there's, there's a lot of them out there yeah yeah sure. but the truth is, is there's also some fucking well-trained people out there in militias and so you can't you can't just you know paint a broad brush like I traditionally do in a show. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about some of the problems with militia. The U.S. has for decades been locked in a reckoning over the breadth of the language of the Second Amendment protecting their rights to keep and bear arms. But in recent months, national attention has been instead shifted to the lesser considered subject of its final clause, a well-regulated militia. This ties into the earlier part of the show. Militia groups have for years argued that their actions are constitutionally protected. But legal analysts say the Constitution does not protect private military groups that are unconnected to or outside the authority of the government. And you can look to some of the militia acts that have uh, passed uh, historically. In the fact, all 50 states prohibit and restrict private militia groups and military activity with several different kinds of laws, as well as provisions included in most state constitutions. Quote, what we're seeing in the kinds of militias that we see today, these sort of self-appointed militias that have no relationship with the state government whatsoever, no authority to speak for the state or for the people of the state, these are not the kinds of militias that are referenced by the Second Amendment, says Adam Winkler, a professor of law at the University of California at Los Angeles, who specializes in constitutional law and gun policy. Both the presence and actions of militia groups at recent racial justice protests, often under the guise of defending or protecting communities, or when they purport to function as law enforcement, violate state laws, says Mary McCord, a former Justice Department lawyer and assistant U.S. attorney who now serves as the legal director at Georgetown University's Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection. Yet the governments go largely, uh, or the groups go largely unchecked because law enforcement often does not enforce anti-militia laws due to a number of overlapping reasons. Most 
based in ignorance or misunderstanding, analysts say. Law enforcement is sometimes simply unaware of state statutes that define and prohibit private militias and paramilitary activity. And this is, goes back to my uh, comment that everyone's you know just made up of dudes, just regular fucking people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you may be a cop. You know what you had to learn in order to become a cop doesn't mean you know every legal statute in the state right. that you live. You just know what is prevalent that deals with the job you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So we can't pretend that simply because you're in a position of authority, you're educated. <laughs> it's Certainly, not yeah. the case. And I, I think there's another layer to that, too. I think a lot of the time when police have to deal with um, with these militias, that they uh, they actually agree with them or even members of them mm -hmm. in several cases. Yeah, or, yeah, or they are active you know? members. And so in these studies and whatnot, it's, it's very hard to get accurate studies of, of criminal activity and things of that nature because people lie. Yeah. <laughs> so, <you> know, um, <laughs> Spoiler I, alert, I, people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've met many, many cops uh, throughout my careers in security and military and law enforcement um, who were either, if not a full fledged member of a militia organization, they were very sympathetic to it. Yeah. So, like, um, like, for example, they might have like an Oath Keeper sticker on the back of their pickup truck, even though they never actually joined the organization, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you can't expect them to go and lock up guys that, a, and I know this sounds counterintuitive to a law and order society, but that, you know, A, they agree with, or B, they actually might drink with on the weekends and train with, you know? Yeah. <laughs> or their happen. respect for whatever reason. Like mm -hmm. we have all these inner biases, you know, if, if you like the same sports team, you're more likely to give them a break. If you right. find someone attractive that you pull over at a traffic stop, a violation you're more likely to give them a break i mean that's just how we operate as humans yeah um okay so there's another quote here i think the nra and other second amendment absolutionists have been remarkably successful over the last several decades at sort of just convincing people the second amendment protects private military or militia activity especially in open carry states mccord says referring to statutes that allow residents to open carry firearms in public and in some cases permit the display of long guns and semi-automatic rifles the line between a citizen legally carrying a weapon in public and what constitutes illegal paramilitary action therefore often goes unrecognized by law enforcement. In 2008, the Supreme Court ruled in a major gun rights case, District of Columbia versus Heller. The citizens have a right to own a firearm for purposes other than being in a militia, namely for self-defense. The ruling affirmed the right of the states to restrict militia-like activity. Quote, there's lots of things that are still gray areas when it comes to protecting Second Amendment activity, like certain types of firearms and things like that. But one thing that has been pretty clear that the Second Amendment does not protect is private paramilitary organizations, McCord says. Mark Pitscavage, we mentioned a quote from him earlier in the show, senior research fellow at the Anti-Defamation League's Center on Extremism, says armed opposition to, gov uh, to groups showing up at recent protests largely fall into two camps, organized militias that are part of the broad right-wing anti-government militia movement and informed groups created in direct response to the demonstrations and what community members see as a threat of violence and destruction from protesters. So hopefully what we're doing here is painting a much more broad stroke image of what militias were originally what they've turned into and why they've turned into them and just the natural human nature that goes into some people wanting to be a part of them, especially yeah. if you've, you know, been a soldier, you like the idea of being a soldier, because let's be honest, some people just don't make the cut and they can't become soldiers, but they still really want to have a that sense of brotherhood of those types end up in the militias. A lot of those exactly. types. Yeah. So, yeah. um, you know, I think ultimately for me, you know, when it comes to this bottom line of militia groups, if, if you're in a militia that is intending to follow the laws and protect your family, friends, and community, I have no problem with you. If you're a militia that is strictly anti-government, but you're relying on government laws to protect your right to be a militia, you're just in fucking ironic, ignorant asshole. Like right. there's no other way about it. You're relying on a government that you actively are trying to destroy 
to protect your right to do so. That yeah, makes it's no like fucking someone, sense. It's like someone receiving like financial assistance from the state, like welfare, saying we gotta we gotta get rid of the welfare state. And yeah. It's like, why? Why yeah. would you do that? It makes no goddamn <laughs> sense. So yeah, um, ultimately, I'm I'm really glad that you you brought up the topic of of wanting to sort of dive into this more. Because I actually learned a lot by researching this more just based on, you know, comparing it to my own anecdotal experiences. But also, you know, just your life experience brings a whole lot to the conversation. Um, and then just, you know, the, the realities of what it actually yeah. is, what militias actually are, I think is interesting. Because there, it's not an innately negative thing um, or a positive thing. It all depends on perception and action as yeah. everything in life. You know, and I, I think that that's one thing that as we're seeing right now at this moment in time, because, you know, of, otherwise, what's the point of talking about it if we don't talk about how it's affecting the world right now? Yeah. Um, we're seeing a series of riots happen around the country. Now, right, wrong or indifferent doesn't matter. We're, we're seeing people rioting in the streets and at least in, in a lot of in most places in the Pacific Northwest, in Austin, in Minneapolis, um, the police and the government in general don't seem to be doing anything about it. Hmm. So a lot, I expect fully from an analytical perspective, I'm not saying I agree with it or not, but I expect fully to see the numbers go drastically up in these militia groups as this happens, because if the government doesn't handle, if they don't keep society functioning, the citizenry themselves will take it upon their shoulders to make it function. And that yeah. may not be a good look in the end. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. I've often said that th the only thing that would make me take up my arms and publicly storm a, a, a state center would be if, for example, our president objectively loses the election but refuses to leave office. That's sure. when, you know, I, I would rather see the facade of a representative democracy that we have than the abandoning of it altogether, uh, right. you know, and I could, into I a dictatorship. That. Yeah. So that's, I don't care who the president is in that yeah. instance, if you refuse to leave office after being elected out, uh, that's the end. And that's the end of democracy at that point. And I will fight with my life on the line in order to protect what me and my brothers in arms and my family uh, ancestry has fought to preserve. I was going to say, we swore an oath yeah. to, to defend for that. So, <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's important that people understand that just because you're standing up to your government in some instances doesn't mean it's a negative thing. Because, again, it's made up of people. Sometimes they get things wrong, and they need a show of force or a protest in order to understand what they've done is wrong. Certainly, because yeah. they're supposed to be serving us. That's what a representative democracy is all about. They are serving our best interests, not their own. And I think arguably you can say that that's not happened for a very long time, but <laughs> we well, like need you to said, strive for it. There's still the, the facade yeah. that it's happening. So at least we have <laughs> At least there's that. At least there's the Halloween mask of right. it. <laughs> We're good enough with that. Uh, all right. So is there anything else that you wanted to talk about with this subject? This um, really deep subject. Yeah, there's, there's so much. We could do another three hours on yeah. this before we really uh, narrowed it down. But I think that uh, when people, uh, the media, as as these situations are happening in the country, the media is going to report on various militia groups. They may even invent groups because it does happen. They may even invent groups that never existed before and say that they are responsible for certain things here and there. Um, I would encourage anyone who's watching this and who distrusts their government or their media, just like I do, to do your own research, read up about these groups, see what they actually believe and stand for. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, take whatever they're reported on either with a grain of salt or go, oh yeah, I know that that checks with, with what I read about them. Um, but at the same time, <laughs> if, uh, if you are like-minded, like Adam and I seem to have this innate distrust of, of the government and this pro uh, gun mentality, uh, things of that nature, uh, you don't need a militia to, to make yourself feel better. If you and your, your, you want to start a neighborhood watch with the rest of your neighbors, 
or you want to do some firearms training with your friends, that's absolutely, I completely support that. But you don't need this national gang, essentially, usually read, led by someone with uh, more faults than you can shake a stick at, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, telling you what to do and, and all of this stuff. Yeah, the government is shit, but uh, it's what we got until it isn't. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that idea. I would I would double down on that call that I think every citizen, especially if you hate firearms, if you are a fervent anti Second Amendment advocate, I think you should learn how to properly use them. I think Absolutely. understanding yeah. how to properly use a firearm takes away the fear of it, but it also means that even if you don't own one, if shit hits the fan, you can still properly take care of you and your family or your friends. And that is, that's your survival. That's it. That's your life. So it, it doesn't really matter. Understand how to fight with a knife. Like there, it doesn't take a lot to understand fundamental basics. Take a self-defense yeah, remember, course. No, no matter how uh, technological or advanced our society seems to become, it happens every single yeah. second of every single day. Violence is natural. It's yeah. a way of our life. And if you're not ready to perform violent actions when you need to, you're just going to be another victim, another yeah. statistic. Yeah. And you don't have to be the, the best, you know, sharpshooter out there, but just understanding yeah. the basics it goes a really, really long way. Um, in, in the same way that I would recommend everyone take a CPR class and understand yeah, basic yeah. medical techniques. Because you never know if your kid is going to be choking to death or someone accidentally cuts an artery. What are you going to do before, you know, medical uh, ambulance gets there? You have to be able to effectively protect the things that you cherish, especially, I, I, and, you know, maybe this is just abusing the, the notion, especially as a Satanist who is, you know, we are very independent people, very selfish people, but some of us choose to put love and care for other people that means you have to take care of that so right. you know if you're one well, of them, it, it just just in general like uh, being a satanist you have to recognize your your place in the world where, right. where you sit in this bigger picture and uh your place in the world at the very end of it all is as this this ape walking around on planet earth you know? <laughs> yeah and there are things that that are going to happen violence is going to happen societies are going to crumble this empire is going to fall apart eventually. The United it States will. isn't going to be here forever. Yeah. Um, and that could happen tomorrow, or it could happen, you know, 100 years from now. Who knows? Um, but all of these things are going to happen. And if you don't have what it takes to protect your family, uh, protect yourself, to, as, as you were saying, Adam, to deal with medical uh, issues, um, things like that, then you're just useless. Yeah. You know, you, you can't... You can't expect to be your own god or the alien elite if you uh, if you're so scared of a gun that you can't even pull the trigger. Yeah, <laughs> it really comes down to taking care of yourself too. If you just want to frame it that way, yeah, like you you have to ensure your own survival. That's that's survival. That that's it. That's all you've got. You know. So, all right. Yeah. Um, that's all I had for this. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in the chat. You guys were throwing out a ton of like discourse between all of you. So I'm going to have to go back and, and, and read all of that, see what you guys are talking about. Um, I know it's easy to draw lines. You know, some of those lines are political. Some are cultural, some are social. Uh, one, the only thing that unites, I think everyone watching this is that we're Satanists and um, understanding that, um, our own survival is the highest law is a very important idea. And um, if you decide to place any type of weight outside of that, you know, depending on how you want to extend your total environment, uh, understanding how to protect and uh, ensure that survival as well is really, really important. Yeah. I you know, I, I, like everyone else, I'm very judgmental and I'm very biased and everything. So when I when I shit on the ideas of militias in a moment of, of a conversation, um, it's very different than an articulated view of a subject. You don't have to agree with me, and that's okay. <laughs> I encourage you to, as as you were saying, Jeff, earlier, 
do your own research on any given topic or any different gr any individual group so that when you do see a news headline you understand it in context you understand the motivations behind it this is all a lesser magic tactics as well so uh, better understanding your world only benefits you in the long run so do it thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode and until we can speak of the devil again hail satan hail satan Is that what it is? It's on there. Okay. That makes so much more sense now.